Hello, in this video, we're talking about quantum uncertainty, your two favorite topics, quantum physics and uncertainty together. Oh, so exciting. That's what we're doing um, because they do really go together in a very fundamental and spooky way. All right, we're talking really about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, ever heard of it? Here we go. So the think about what we know so far about stuff in quantum physics, particles in quantum physics, because they're not really particles at all. Everything can be described by a wave function. So a particle, quote unquote, is a thing that like has momentum. And remember, anything that has momentum has an associated wavelength, says the de Broglie hypothesis. This equation, not in the data booklet, you do want to know. Right, the wavelength of a thing is Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the thing. So if, for example, I said something had a perfectly defined momentum, like I don't worry about any kind of uncertainty at all, I say this thing has a momentum of six or whatever, that's a crazy number for this, but um, that would give me a nice, beautiful wave with a beautiful wavelength. It would look like this, like a nice sine wave or something, yeah? And I could be like, oh, the wavelength, easy, easy to do. Just measure the distance between the peaks and it's the same everywhere, right? That would be like a constant, always the same wavelength. A nice classic sine wave you know math relationship however remember what this whole crazy wavelength thing means now because the wave we're talking about like what is waving nothing really this wave has no physical meaning until you square it because we're talking about like a wave function and the wave function says something about probability the wave function says something about the probability of finding something at a certain place and remember what we said about the wave function it's most likely to find the particle where the probability is highest. So where's the probability the highest? Well, like everywhere, like here and here and here and here and here and here. This thing could be anywhere. All right, so if I know the momentum really clearly, I can't say anything about where it is because where it is is where the peaks are the highest and the peaks are the same everywhere because it's a perfect sine wave. All right, this is like fundamentally where this weird stuff we're gonna get into with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes in from, it's because of wave particle duality, because this is how the math of waves works. If you know the wavelength very clearly, then we don't know anything. It doesn't have a higher value at any position than anywhere else. Okay. All right, here's an example of one. Here's a wave function. So there's not a lot of crazy stuff here, but um, the two on the left especially are really good. So they're showing in blue the wave function and in red the wave function squared because remember that's the one that's about probability. Down here they have like a probability heat map, if you want, of um, you know, like where the particle's most likely to be found. So just remember how this works. If I have a wave function that looks like this, our uh, Arctic monkeys, monkeys cover, um, then there's places where the peaks are really high and places where the peaks aren't high at all. I square the wave function, that would kind of, you know, roughly look like this. So it's really high in the middle. Like this thing is probably somewhere around here. Pretty confident about that. Because again, the likely positions I could find it is here. So I have some like region, let's call it delta x, where I feel confident that this thing probably is. Um, okay, whereas down here, there's some other particle defined by some other wave function. It's got some other kind of situation going on. So the wave function is a perfect sine wave. The wave function squared is a sine squared graph. I don't know where it is. It could be here. It could be here. It could be here. It could be here. It could be anywhere. So I don't know its position at all. It's a much bigger and more spread out. But the wavelength is really nice. These are showing this kind of corresponding momentums. You can kind of think about how that applies, but we'll, we'll look at something next to maybe help with that here. All right. Um, but, you know, that's the idea. If the, um, if the, Wavelength is known well, the position will not be known well. And that's because of wave particle duality. It is one thing to, I'll get ahead of here. This has nothing to do with like measurement or instruments or limitations of our measurements. This is the rules of physics say we can't know both. If I want to know something well and I want to get that kind of wave shape that looks something like this, um, remember the way this kind of works is you get a weird pulsy looking wave like this as it, when you have a superposition of multiple different waves with different wavelengths. Okay, if I add this wave to this wave to this wave to this wave to this wave, they will equal something that maybe looks like this, where I get a weird wave where at one kind of magic point, I don't know, can we find one where like the peaks more or less all line up of the different waves? I get like a really big combined peak here, but there's places where they cancel each other out in weird ways and whatever, it gets complicated. But you can get some kind of superposition that looks like this. So if you get a thing 
where you have a graph of a, a, a wavy graph where it's bigger in some places and smaller in one, some other places, the only way that happens is because it's a math combination of multiple different waves, right? Multiple different sine waves with different frequencies, uh, if you like. So this would help us with localizing, we say, the wave. Um, you know, we, we have a good idea of where this is because, again, some peaks have higher values different places, which tells me it's more likely to be there. But by doing this, I now don't have a definitive momentum because what's the momentum if, like, it's a combination of this wave with this wavelength and this wave with this wavelength? Like, what's the wavelength of this wave? Well, there's an A wavelength. I could do an average maybe, but um, it's kind of, it's, it's not consistent, right? So we don't know it very well. Uh, it's not a single value. And so the way we're going to deal with that is we attribute some uncertainty, which really does mean something. Okay, so here's what it boils down to. That's kind of the ideas, if that helps a little bit, of why this happens, because it's all wave-particle duality, and you can't know one without knowing the other fundamentally because of how waves work, all right? Um, practically speaking, for the IB exams, here's what it comes down to. Uh, there's two equations, and the equations deal with complementary quantities. So position and momentum are two examples of that. Uh, there's one other example. But if I multiply like my position x by momentum, um, you know, m times v, I get these units. Turns out uh, things that when you multiply them together and these get these units have special uncertainty like properties like this. They have this weird wave particle duality stuff going on. We call them complementary quantities. Any things, there's really only two sets, but the sets of things that when you multiply them together, you get these units. And if you have two complementary quantities, they're complementary because you they trade off in terms of their certainty, if you want. Um, all right, you, there's only a certain precision you can know for one versus the other. And generally speaking, we'll do the math in a second, but generally speaking, if you know one really well, you don't know the other well at all, and vice versa. Yeah, again, can't stress this enough. The IB is going to try to trick you with this. This has nothing to do with measurement uncertainty. This is not because we're like not good enough at measuring stuff. Again, this comes from the math of how wave-particle duality works that is inherent in the universe that you cannot know um, one versus the other and that not even probably good to say that we can't know it because that's nothing to do with us. If a particle has a clearly defined momentum, its position is poorly defined um, and is very uncertain and then it could be many different places. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the first equation in your data booklet and how we're going to deal with this. We have two uncertainties multiplied together and it's an inequality because there's a minimum. There's got to be some uncertainty. Okay, so delta x is going to represent uncertainty in position. We're going back to using delta for our absolute uncertainty uh, notation. And delta p is the uncertainty in momentum. You multiply those together and that comb combined product has to be at least h over 4 pi big. Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. That's the minimum um, amount. It could be more. Usually you just set them equal when you solve these problems because uh, we're looking for like the kind of cutoff or limitation or minimum or whatever. All right, but that's the rule. There's got to be some uncertainty. And it's got to be at least that much when you multiply the uncertainties together. Okay. Um, and there's another one. Guess what? There are two other units that you can multiply together and get those same combined units Convince yourself that a joule times a second gives you the same units as a momentum times position, but they do, and you get the same thing. So this one's even wilder. But energy and time, it turns out, are complementary quantities, and you have uncertainty in both of them. Uncertainty in time, what does that mean? I'll show you. All right, pair production is one big place that this can come up in a specific pair production example. There's a lot of places both of these come up. Um, I encourage you to check out Cognity and Schoology, there's some fun videos of how like Heisen, you can think of a bunch of things, even something as simple as like single slit diffraction or double slit diffraction you can do with a crazy application of this idea of like not knowing momentum very well and which way a thing is going. Okay, but let's review pair production a little bit. Um, this is what happens. This is a thing that can happen. We know this can happen from particle physics. You can have a photon of light, uh, let's say a gamma ray, hanging out, flying around. Usually the trigger for this is it's like near a strong electric field, like near a nucleus or something. And that photon is energy, but remember, energy equals mc squared. And energy and mass, not really different things, not really. 
And that photon can, photon can just decide, like, oh, I'm tired of traveling at the speed of light and being light and not having any mass. I want to have mass. And so it just disappears from existence and in its place forms a positron and an electron. That's totally fine because everything's conserved. It made a lepton and an anti-lepton. So to the universe, there's not like a different amount of leptons. It made a positive and a negative charge. So charge is conserved. Everything's conserved. Everything's fine. Um, this is allowed to happen, right? Um, you can figure out how much energy it needs to have. Try this. Use your data booklet. Look up stuff about an electron and see if you can tell me how much energy that gamma ray should have. Go ahead. Okay, did you use E equals MC squared? That's the move. You look up the mass of an electron and we have these convenient units that have like E equals MC squared baked in. So I would use this unit. You could use the U unit and do all kinds of crazy stuff with 300 million squared, but that's uh, a lot. So this is the mass of an electron. So the total mass that was, let's say, created by this photon is 1.022 million electron volts per C squared. If I want to figure out how much energy that would take to make then, I use E equals MC squared. And so remember the fun thing about this unit, it's got the speed of light squared baked in in the denominator. So we really invented this unit to use in this equation so that when I multiply by C squared, these just cancel out and I end up with this energy in million electron volts. Again, do sweat the detail on that and make sure you think about and show, especially like on a paper two, that you know the difference between an MeV per C squared and MeV. They're totally different things, even though it's just a weird kind of cheater unit. All right, so the energy that it would take, the photon should have this much energy, 1.022 million electron volts. And as okay as you can be with this stuff at this point in the course, hopefully you're okay with like, all right, all right, fair enough. Uh, if you got a million electron volts of energy, photon, go ahead, turn into an electron and positron. I guess that's fine. All right, well, here's an even saucier one. You can have a gamma ray with only half of an MeV that does pair production, which totally violates uh, rules of conservation of energy. That's definitely not allowed. But the trick is everything's uncertain. There's uncertainty in everything. So what if, here's what the gamma ray does. And um, per, forgive me for personifying because this is a, uh, just for funsies, this is the gamma ray doesn't really have thoughts and feelings. Okay, but the gamma ray is like, oh boy, I only got 0.5 million electron volts of energy. Um, it does what like lots of students try to do on their IAs and stuff. They're like, well, what if I just said though that my energy was 0.5 plus or minus like 0.6? And then maybe it's fine. Yeah, if the uncertainty is big enough, it's it can do it. You just also then have an uncertainty in time that's pretty big. So here's how this works. Really, it would need to have at least this much energy in, sorry, this much uncertainty in the energy. You would need the, the energy of the photon to be 0.5 plus or minus 0.522 million electron volts because then it could conceivably have enough energy to uh, do this thing, right? To make, to make the electron positron. Um, and so... You, you set it up so that basically your uncertainty and energy covers like the difference that you need. Um, and we're going to turn it into joules because these equations, remember, have like Planck's constant and stuff built in, which have joules baked in. So we're going to go back to our base units. So I want to have that much uncertainty and energy, and we'll like talk about what this nonsense means, but I, I need that. I need enough uncertainty to cover, uh, you know, or like, uh, we're like take it, taking out energy on a loan. Okay. Um, so we're going to use this equation. If I have enough uncertainty and energy, I can do that pair production, even though maybe we don't really have enough energy to do it. Um, what you do then is to solve for delta T because it's all going to come down to this. So we're going to put in this number for delta E. So try it, put in your calculator, put in that number for delta E. We're going to just divide both sides by that. These are, H is just a constant, right? Put in your data booklet. So that's how we get this. You get delta T is greater than or equal to this. Okay, so delta T, your uncertainty in time has to be at least that big. All right, what that means, what this uncertainty in time means, this is kind of confusing, but we call that the expected lifetime of the particle. The time uncertainty has to be at least that big to cover it up. And so this is like officially not allowed to happen. If a 0.5 million electron volt gamma ray makes a proton or an electron and a positron, it's not allowed. It doesn't have enough energy. Um, but if the time is small enough, 
that the uncertainty in time covers it up, then it's like it never happened at all. So delta T is called the maximum lifetime of the particles. So I don't know, just for an example, let's say, uh, let's say T is like three times 10 to the minus 22 seconds. This can happen if the electron and positron only exist for this long before they annihilate each other. All right, and uh, we do detect this kind of stuff happening. All right, so the electron and positron, if they only exist for three times 10 to the 20 minus 22 seconds, it's totally fine that we broke the law for conservation of energy because they, uh, well, they existed for three times 10 to the minus 22 seconds plus or minus six times 10 to the minus 22 seconds. And so they could have not existed at all, says math. They could have just not done it. They could have not broken the law of physics. So as long as the uncertainty covers everything up, it's like totally fine. And these things happen all the time. And we get all these little virtual particles popping in and out of reality constantly um, all over the place in all kinds of weird situations because of this crazy uncertainty stuff. Okay. So that concept is a doozy to wrap your head around. It will take some thinking and practice. But again, doing the math is easy. You divide constants by like one number and solve for the other number. Okay. So when they ask you to find the maximum lifetime of a particle, you use the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and you do this process. Um, they might also ask you to find a, like uncertainty in momentum or uncertainty in position, and you do the same exact thing with the other thing. The math is super easy, trivial, even very simple to do. Very simple to like get the math for these right on a on a paper one and paper two. Uh, another one of those fun things where if you really think about it and think about what's going on, it should keep you up in your sleep because it's crazy. Quantum physics is crazy. All right, but there you go. There's Heisenberg uncertainty. Um, check out some extra stuff. Watch some extra videos, or you could you could go down a pretty deep rabbit hole on this stuff. It's pretty fun. But uh, at least try practicing with those equations, see how they go, and get confident with those. Have fun.